So there exists uh, two challenges that should strike fear into the hearts and minds of every C-level executive in any tech company around the world. You can't throw hardware at these challenges and you can't solve them with thousands of lines of Perl scripts. And mistakes made with these challenges can take years to correct if they don't even just prove fatal uh, to the business or organization straight away. And these challenges go by the names of recruitment and retention. And I wonder if you've stopped to consider how the uh, policies and practices that your company or organization has, how they affect uh, these two challenges. Uh, suddenly when I uh, joined Booking.com back in 2014, I had no idea just how much I was going to experience and enjoy uh, the concepts of remote working. And I wonder um, how much you guys know about uh, Booking.com. Uh, we have over uh, 17,000 employees uh, around the world. And I actually met one of my colleagues this morning, happened to be sat right next to them. Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, but when I joined um, the company, we only actually had about four offices worldwide where you would say there's bona fide tech staff working. Uh, I joined the Cambridge office and immediately I had that feeling of remoteness. About maybe 90%, maybe over 95% of our staff work in our headquarters in Amsterdam. So immediately there's, there's that, that, that feeling of um, being remote from the main thrust. <coughs> and I wonder if I can have a quick show of hands. How many people here uh, have worked remotely or work remotely right now? Very good. And can you keep your hands up if you're actually working remotely right now? Uh, <laughs> yep, very good. Very good. Do you want to come up and do the rest of the talk? No. no? Okay. Well, we'll carry on. So the, the talk is going to cover um, a bunch of lessons uh, that I've learned from about remote working. We're going to look at some of the highs and lows, some of the pitfalls, um, some of the ways actually the remote working has impacted local working, and hopefully we're going to have some time to look at how DevOps has influenced remote working as well. So where and when do you feel that you do your best work? Uh, when I was working in Cambridge, I was commuting from Peterborough, and one of the things I've learned about British commuter trains is that nobody talks to anybody else on them, that the only people talking are, are on the phone. Um, and I also found that the Wi-Fi was, at least a few years back, was pretty sketchy. I guess the train companies would say there's the wrong kind of leaves on the access point or some similar excuse. Um, but this was great because I could go into one of those spaces between carriages and I could write some code in a focus way for about an hour and it was absolute bliss. And I wonder if you're fortunate enough uh, to work at one of these tech companies that have, have figured out that the lack of distraction is actually useful. Because it seems to me that most tech companies today like to put us all into a big open plan office and have us talking to each other all day long. And if we're not talking enough, there's still all the meeting rooms that you can go into and talk <laughs> some more. Um, and um, what I would suggest is that you try and inject a little bit of remoteness even into this context. So, for instance, find a corner of the office where you can go hide and, and be away from your desk and away from distractions uh, for an hour or two a day, perhaps. Are you finding your, that you're able to carve out that focus time during your day? Well, as I said, I was in Cambridge and uh, my <laughs> colleagues um, over time started to relocate to Amsterdam or move on, and I came to the point where I was the only person in Cambridge in, yeah, in Cambridge in my team, so the rest of my team were in Amsterdam. So it didn't make sense to commute for three hours a day to just be with colleagues but not teammates. So working from home seemed to make sense, but um, if like me, you've got some kids, I've got four kids now, um, working from home, distraction free, <laughs> not necessarily possible. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, I had the perfect excuse to build the perfect man cave. Um, <laughs> wife signed off on it, it was all good. Um, and maybe uh, this is an option for you. Maybe you're thinking, I don't really have a home office space, but I can tell you it's a lot of fun uh, building out that little uh, log cabin in the backyard. So another lesson I've learned about uh, remote working <laughs> is that you're not signing up to a lifetime of solitary confinement. So maybe some of you right now have a really strong opinion about remote working. Maybe you really want to do it, or maybe you think that you'd really hate it. Um, well, actually, what I found is that this kind of opinion swings and varies during your, your kind of career. And this is backed up by research that came out of Stanford University. They, they worked in conjunction with a Chinese travel firm called Sea Trip. 
and they conducted a nine-month randomized experiment where one group of people uh, were allowed to work from home, and another group uh, was kept in the office. And one of the striking things that came out of this research was that at the end of it, 50% of those people who'd worked from home decided that they wanted to come back to the office. And 35% of the people who originally said they had wanted to work from home but worked in the office during the experiment decided that they would stay in the office after all. So um, opinions and moves can kind of vary over your career with regard to this. But the real high point of this, uh, this research, this experimentation that was done, was that during the experiment, performance improved by 13% for those people who worked at home compared to those in the office. But when people actually got to choose, because CTRIP were excited by this 13% improvement, when people got to choose whether they stayed at worked at home or in the office, the improvement was actually 22%. And CTRIP reported that they saved around $2,000 uh, per person per year who worked at home. Uh, partly because of the high real estate costs in Shanghai. So I wonder, uh, could there be similar benefits to be had in your own company or organization with changing perhaps some of your policies around remote working? So uh, working on a log cabin in my backyard uh, turned out just to not be remote enough. So uh, I took the family and we traveled 5,000 miles away from our headquarters to a location completely outside of our, our main headquarters working day in Seattle. And so why do we have an office in Seattle? We also have one in Singapore. Um, this is for follow the sun on call support. And this is um, such an important part of the company because it allows our engineers in Amsterdam to get some really good sleep. They know that there's some core infrastructure people looking on to the website making sure systems or services are up and okay. Sure, we have to phone them up from time to time, but at least they've got that first uh, point of eyes on the grass. So maybe there's an opportunity for you to, uh, to introduce some remote colleagues into your situation so that those talented people that you're paying thousands for every year can actually get that quality of sleep they need to do their jobs effectively. So. Uh, another great thing, another high point about having offices around the world is, for example, the uh, pools of talent you can tap into. As you can imagine, Seattle's pretty, pretty decent for this. Um, and so, you know, are you able to attract the talent that you need in just a, a single office location? I don't think we could. There's also a second aspect. There's at least a couple of us in Seattle who, if we didn't have the opportunity to keep working in that office, we might well not be with the company anymore. So there's a retention aspect to that as well. Another great point about working in a remote team is you get a real sense of camaraderie and uh, team spirit. So there's only about maybe 12 of us out in Seattle. So we're a tight-knit bunch uh, looking after some pretty core services and we bear up pretty well under the strain uh, and keep one another going. Um, and DevOps actually, the DevOps space lends itself really well to remote working and I'll, I'll come back to this a bit later in the talk but I just want to say if you can imagine the sort of systems and APIs and services you operate with in the DevOps space tend to be a little bit more stable than say new product development where you have a very high rate of change, lots of experimentation, very rapidly changing APIs. So it's a little bit easier for us to work remotely. That said, uh, Booking are trying to move away from their, their monolithic code base, be a bit more service oriented. And so we may even see in time that uh, product development can happen uh, remotely as well. So, um, I've mentioned some highs here. Uh, there's a, uh, it is actually, however, not all plain sailing. So one of the, one of the uh, problems with remote working is a feeling of isolation. Uh, in particular, you know, just being completely outside of that, those working hours. So booking.com have tried to resolve this or address this down the years by flying large swathes of the company into Amsterdam. So we have a big celebration, we feel connected with one another. However, clearly this doesn't scale, ultimately. So we're trying to work out how uh, that kind of sense of connectedness is gonna work in a global sense going forward. And I wondered if you have at your company a strategy for connecting employees. Have you, have you thought this through? There's also another aspect that the company invests in, which is kind of community building. So uh, for this, we have some tools. Uh, we've started to use Workplace, which has come out of Facebook. And initially, the signal-to-noise ratio 
was really bad. So you'd see posts from some very random office about what are we going to have for dinner tonight, you know, irrelevant stuff. But once they tune that down, um, it's actually become really useful for um, um, coordinating teams and groups around particular problems and tasks that we're trying to solve and address. And the question is, do you have uh, a strategy for building communities within your own companies or organizations? So some pitfalls, uh, common pitfalls that I've seen uh, with remote working. Uh, one classic one that you'll see stated by companies that have a lot of remote staff is we hire a, a bunch of like-minded individuals and they work really well in a remote context. It sounds good on the face of it, but can you see any flaws in that? Well, the problem is in these kind of words, like-minded. Um, so one of the most important assets any company has is the variety of ideas, the diversity of ideas of its staff and employees. And if, if everybody's like-minded, there's a real chance that you won't have um, enough of the ideas you need to cover the scopes and context of the marketplace in which you're trying to succeed. Another common pitfall with companies uh, is that they don't quite realize uh, that they've grown to the point where they now have incorporated the sense of remote working. So for example, you might say that um, when a company has grown to two offices, you have a sense of remoteness. But in actual fact, quite often that happens even when you've just gone to two floors in the same office building. And so perhaps you will see um, things happening or things said in your company a bit like this. Let's grab a coffee and chat about this. Or, um, or maybe you see that decisions made from those chats aren't really written down in any way, they're just expressed verbally. Or perhaps you're relying heavily on tribal knowledge uh, to tackle issues or problems at hand. And these are all signs that um, you perhaps haven't grasped just how fast and, and big you're growing. Or, or at least they should be tackled before, you, before the growth forces you to do so. It's worth considering them early. Another pitfall I see, uh, see often is this sense that if you have a team, they all have to be remote or they all have to be in the same space. And I think if we start to consider, we could probably come up with um, individuals or people that we can think of that can work quite happily remotely to a team. They don't feel particularly isolated. They're a great contributor. They can actually be really big assets um, for the company. And, um, and they, they can actually have quite a good impact on the team. Some of the things that they, that they bring to that. For, in, for instance, some of the team can be working with clients whilst others are really focused working on a particular problem that that team needs to solve. And I also see remote companies uh, fall into the pitfall of saying something along the lines of, and we, we hang out on video all day long, video chat. And I would harken back a little bit to the open plan office uh, spiel there. And, and with my experience of video conferencing, I can't really think of much worse than having to be in a video meeting for eight hours a day. I think that would, I think that would drive most of us back into the office, to be honest. So there are some ways that remote working can really impact, in a beneficial way, local working. And one of these is communication. So if you have some remote staff, you can no longer just make verbal decisions. You kind of need to write some more stuff down. You need to make sure that you're including members of your team. And this is actually a good thing. So teams with remote staff tend to veer towards the over-communication end of the spectrum. Uh, furthermore, if you have a meeting, um, you're now going to probably start this meeting on time because your remote worker doesn't know that you're all chatting in the kitchen, <coughs> for instance. So it gives you a little bit more discipline around how you operate as a team. Remote working is also super useful for um, controlling or, or um, enhancing the way that you respond to incidents. So for example, when your website goes down late at night or at the weekend, um, this is a really bad time to find out that when too many people connect to the VPN it crashes. Or when your customer DNS servers have gone down, this is a really bad time to find out that nobody knows what the IP address of the VPN endpoints were to get in and fix them. And similarly, this is a really bad time to start learning how the teleconferencing system works. And if you have remote workers with you all the time, they're going to be utilizing some of these systems. And so you're going to exercise them more. But even if you don't, do you have in place training or procedures 
uh, for incidence response. Super important. So another aspect of, uh, of remote working that we see in Seattle is the commits messages that come out of the, at the end of the Amsterdam day. I don't quite know what it is. People seem to feel they need to push their commits before they go home, otherwise they'll be lost. But, so we sometimes need to review them and we might be rolling them out, we might be reverting them. And it never ceases to amaze me uh, the creativity that people have to come up with basically semantic variations of the word fixed. Um, just occasionally though, we do get a, a high quality commit message and that will tell us not just the uh, what, but the why. So we might see why was this change made? What impact might it have? How has it been tested? How can we revert it? Who to contact in a problem? Uh, and so much more. And it's just like a breath of fresh air. And I wonder, when was the last time you kind of stopped to reflect on the quality of your own commit messages? Um, because they say a lot about how you value others. Are you considering others who might have to read those messages? Um, it's worth, worth spending a couple of minutes thinking about. Another really good aspect of remote working uh, is that it um, enables people to work asynchronously. And what do I mean by this? Well, imagine you're, you're working remotely and you know that the answer to your problem is only going to come back once the Earth has spun on its axis, almost one complete rotation. So you're not going to go home before you've made sure that you've emailed out to the team that you need to get the answer back from. Otherwise, you might have a multiple day delay. So what this encourages you to do is make progress on the areas that you can make progress, and on those that you can't, you try and unblock yourself for the future. You also take a high responsibility about, say, attending meetings at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. in the morning, because you know that's going to be important to, to getting things done. And so you end up with people who are able to uh, deal with competing commands, uh, sorry, demands. Um, they're able to make progress in the face of challenges, and they uh, take a high degree of responsibility. And unsurprisingly, these kind of character traits are super useful both locally and remotely. And so I wonder how you consider where, where you measure up on those kind of traits. So to look a little bit of, at DevOps, so we can, we can think uh, about how we deploy software and how that impacts remote working. So obviously, we probably heard the horror stories of software releases that take multiple years, uh, multiple uh, months of QA, multiple people signing off at various stages, and when it comes to release, everybody's <laughs> got to be physically present to deal with any potential eventualities. Um, but compare that with the, the automated deployment pipeline where most of the developers who've written the code are in bed asleep. Um, you've got your monitoring that's going to see, okay, this new release has introduced a rise in errors, so we're going to automatically revert back uh, to the previous known working version. And when you think about those two comparisons, you can see how much easier that makes it or facilitates people from working remotely in those contexts. So some of these toolings have been super, super helpful. And you heard Canary, or Canaries mentioned earlier today. Uh, this is another DevOps process. Uh, it came out of uh, mining um, terminology. People would carry a canary down into the mines, and uh, they were more susceptible to, say, carbon monoxide buildup. So if the canary fell asleep, you knew it was time to get out of the mine. Uh, and, and in production services, you see that news in terms of giving perhaps two times, three times traffic to a particular set of nodes. And they're the ones that are liable to fall over faster and give you an indication. Well, you can actually apply this uh, to remote working. So let's say you have a remote team. They can kind of be your canary. And if you're finding that they are really struggling to make progress to get things done, um, that can be an indication that there might be something up with your communication or documentation. But if you're publishing APIs and within a couple of days they're building on them, making meaningful services, value add, then this is probably an indication that the canary is, is alive and well. So I wonder if the, if the close proximity of your staff might be masking some of these underlying issues. Maybe the, those issues are there, but without having a remote uh, team or remote workers, it's just not actually apparent that those, those problems exist. So to conclude, it's actually pretty hard to stop losing the remote as I think we all know. It all disappears down the back of the couch every day. But, um, but this is just a fact of reality in the tech industry. This is a pretty hard topic area. There's a lot of um, varying opinions. And if you think you've actually got this all figured out in your own company or organization, 
then I would say either uh, your company has less than two people working for it, <laughs> or you might be mildly delusional in this, in this category, or you should in fact um, write uh, the definitive book on this topic, and, and I would certainly, certainly pre-order a copy of that today. So, so yeah, I haven't given you, I think, the definitive answers here for remote working because I don't know that they exist, but I hope I've um, stirred in you some questions, some thoughts, some ideas. Uh, obviously, there's some, some open sessions uh, later today. Maybe this discussion can continue. Obviously, you can grab me and chat, but hopefully there's uh, time for some questions now. Being the canary all the time could be quite frustrating, so mm. how do you ensure the canary feels supported? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, but as you, I don't know if everyone heard that, it was uh, being the canary all the time can be quite frustrating, so, so how do you ensure that it gets supported well? So um, we do have a travel budget for the guys down in Seattle. We'll typically come out to, to Amsterdam three or, five, three or four times a year, something like that. So we do have a chance to, to make those face-to-face -face connections, and that is kind of important. So you can talk to people over, over book face video, but there's, there's quite a big difference about going, going out for a beer with someone or working alongside someone physically. So we do have to make, those, make the most of those opportunities to develop those relationships that we can then utilize in that remote setting. Um, some of the other ways uh, would be just that kind of shared experience between the team. So we're all in that same boat together. Um, so we can hopefully you know, encourage one another. Uh, it's, a, it's just one of those shared pain points. But also I think, as someone mentioned earlier, there's, there's a good opportunity to give feedback uh, and to influence um, the situation or the status quo. So providing good feedback to the rest of the organization about what's working and what's not working is, is, a, is kind of a key part of being that canary. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Do we have any other questions for Daniel? No. Nope. In that case, we will leave it there for now. But uh, you're right. around for a while. So. Yep. Round for us conference. Come and grab me anytime. Excellent. Right. Thanks, so thank you again. <laughs>